we interrupt this program for some breaking news. A hurricane has just been sighted across the Yid region. Hurricane Lewin is moving through the region at an alarming rate, and reports even say that he has bought the Pursuit Ring, which is frankly overkill. Our advice would be to pray to whatever god you believe in, for our end is nigh. Back to your regularly scheduled analysis. One trope I'm not sure if I love or hate is the trope where a character's fate or some big story detail is left up to audience interpretation. On the one hand, I like definite closure. If a story arc has started, I want to see it end. I don't want to fill in the blanks, I'm here to read a story, not make a story. On the other hand, opening things up to fan theories can make for fun conversations to have that can give a work life long after its initial release. This trope has been done well many times in the past, the briefcase in Pulp Fiction being the biggest example that I can think of, and Fire Emblem has done this most successfully, in my opinion, with Lewin from FE4. What about Lewin is so up for debate? Well, let's just look at his character from top to bottom, and we can talk about the mysteries as they come up. It's time to look at the Child of the Wind. Lewin first appears in the middle of Chapter 2 as he's in the middle of a bunch of villages about to be ransacked by some nationally backed bandits. He volunteers to go drive them off with his wind magic, and the villagers think he's just blowing his own horn too much. Lewin takes some offense to that, but he soldiers on to help them anyway. This would immediately paint him as a likable character, who's got a sort of underdog shtick going on that would make him easy to root for, but that likability is immediately dashed when Sylvia shows up running after him before he goes out to fight, chastising him for his... behavior. Oi! Lewin! Running off behind my back now, are ya? Sylvia? Damn! Er, I mean, you found me! Yeah, I found ya. You've had your fun with me, so you're just dumping me without so much as a goodbye? Hey, hey, careful with that tongue of yours. We barely just met here a week ago. We've only been out to dinner for... what? two or three times. You're a dancer, I'm a bard. There's not much else to it. But, but you called me adorable. That, that really meant a lot to me. It's, sometimes I just say things and don't really mean them. So in his very introduction, he's shown to be a sleazy womanizer. But surely things have to get better for him, right? Right? Well, shortly afterwards, a Pegasus knight named Fury is seen looking for him, revealing him to be a runaway prince from the northern country of Selyse. When she manages to find him, she remarks that his mother is worried sick about him, and that he should come home to rule the nation as its king, and he is less than ecstatic about that idea. He starts by actually making some sense. He says that his uncles would protest his rule and cause a civil war, which would only make the common folk of the country suffer for things they had no control over. But he also remarks that part of it is he likes being free out in the world. So there is the fact that he just doesn't want any responsibility, and just wants to keep doing his own thing. Fury eventually convinces him to grow up and come home, but he asks her to let him stick with Sigurd a while so he can quote, muster the nerve, slang for delay it until he has to deal with it. So, Lewin is characterized as a dickbag womanizer who also enjoys dodging responsibility. Is he really that unlikable? Well, not quite. He has a conversation with Sigurd about the blue-haired lad's tendency to rush into battle and how maybe, just maybe, it isn't always a good idea. He chastises Sigurd for barging into war after war, and how doing so fucks over the common folk of all the nations he's, quote, liberating. Sigurd actually completely agrees with Lewin, and talks about wanting to leave Augustria and negotiate with Chagall peacefully, which Lewin remarks would be a complete waste of time that would solve nothing. Sigurd is stuck in a sort of Dan if you do, Dan if you don't, and Lewin sees that Sigurd's heart is genuinely in the right place, so he gets off his case and agrees to help him out. This scene, along with about half of what he said to Fury, shows that Lewin is keenly aware of the plight of the common man. And though he has some... personality flaws, Lewin is a caring man at heart, which gives him enough likability to be tolerated. Lewin's next story role is when Sigurd and company arrive in Selyse 
After a whole bunch of bullshit thanks to Langabolt and Reptor, Queen Lana is getting along wonderfully with Sigurd, as his sense of responsibility and chivalry make him like the good son she never had. And her actual son takes some offense to this. The Queen is rightfully pissed about Lewin just ditching his problems for several years, and Lewin shows some level of guilt over this, apologizing to her and bringing up that, hey, he's home safe now, so that's gotta count for something, right? Obviously, that doesn't excuse his childishness, and Lana just tells him that they should talk later, and Lewin still clearly doesn't grasp the scope of what he has to deal with. He tries to cheer up his mom with empty words and shoulder massages. It's clear he's treating abandoning Celise like he accidentally dented his mom's car. The gravity of things haven't really dawned on him yet. Unfortunately for Lewin, Udral has a habit of making its characters accept things without their consent, as that civil war his uncles were brewing finally starts. In a battle that follows, the capital is overthrown, Lana is held prisoner, and Manya, Fury's sister and a general in Selyse's army, is killed in battle. This defeat hits Lewin hard. It's Manya's death that makes him finally realize what a child he's been, and the knowledge that he has some growing up to do. Ah, Lewin. I'm so sorry about what happened to Manya. I had no idea Young Bee's Bow Knights would get involved in this mess. No, it's not your fault. Just mine. I just haven't been thinking right lately. I should have been here all along, looking after Mother and the country. But nope, I just ran away. That's why Manya died. She just took my place in all this. There's no need to blame yourself. The best you can do now is care for the Queen, and ensure that Manya didn't die in vain. Yeah, I know. No use pointing out the obvious, huh? Once the capital is retaken, Lewin can have a talk with his mother where he says all the things you want to hear him say. He shows genuine concern for his mother and his kingdom's safety, and he makes a vow to stick by it now. He swears he won't leave his mother's side ever again, though she disagrees. The world is getting kinda fucked right now, and Lewin's talents are more needed by Sigurd's side than his own home right now, so Lana sends him off with his birthright, the Forseti Tome. With this, Lewin sets off to wander the world with Sigurd, not because he's some lazy, aimless bum like before, but because he has a genuine purpose now. He will become the guiding wind that leads the world. These scenes work because when he was introduced, he was really just a womanizing prick who did have his heart in the right place for the common man. He was far from a wise king that could do anything to help those common people he was sympathetic towards. He was just a punk dodging his responsibilities. But due to the tragedies that unfolded to the people he loved and cared about, he was forced to grow up and mature in a very short amount of time. Seeing Lewin grow into that noble king he was running away from for so long is very satisfying to see. It plays into a reader's love of seeing character growth and seeing people do good things. These scenes also work because the Forseti tome he gets from them turns him into a god for the one and a third chapters you have it for. While a character's likability mostly stems from, you know, the character, some Fire Emblem characters carve popularity for themselves based on how much of a god they are to use. While Rutger and Seth are genuinely good characters, most fans of them aren't so because they like their dialogue or backstory, they're beloved because of how amazing they are as units. Lewin with Forseti gets so much speed, he's nearly untouchable. So much damage, he's nearly unstoppable. So much skill, he's nearly un... un... He never misses an attack. As such, Lewin is fondly remembered by players because of how much he can pretty much solo the last map of Sigurd's tail on his own, and that kind of power sticks with you. Unfortunately, after Solis, it's the Yi Desert, the moment where pretty much everyone in Sigurd's army dies except for people the writers randomly chose for some reason. But thankfully, Lewin managed to make it out okay. He reappears 17 years later in front of Selif, who's just started fighting back against the Empire. And with 17 years of experience, Lewin's learned some new things. Now he has depression! Oh, Lewin! Er, pardon me. Your Majesty, King Lewin of Selyse. It's just Lewin, Selif. 
like I've always been. Selyss is just another Imperial Conquest now. That's all it's been since the mess in Belhalla. And meanwhile, here I am, still living a pathetic, shameful life for all to see. At least my mother faced Selyss's demise, and her own, with pride and dignity. But me? Nope. I'm just an idiot bard. Don't listen to what Oiface says of me, Selif. Just please, don't call me a king ever again. In just one little speech, we get a lot on how Lewin's character has grown in the gap between the generations. If he was guilty over just Manya, good lord are things much worse. It's very easy to feel sorry for him, and thus, he's being endeared to the player even more. In the second generation, Lewin takes on the role of Seleph's advisor. He is no longer an active unit, but instead someone for Seleph to talk to in cutscenes and spew exposition about things. As such, Lewin gets a lot of lines in the second generation, I think he might even have more lines than Seleph, but a lot of it isn't really character stuff. It's more so just stuff like, this is happening in this place, or this thing happened back then here. It's interesting stuff, because Yu Drawl has great world building, but it isn't really stuff that needs to be discussed in a Lewin character analysis. The main point I want to make is that Lewin is a very good mentor for Selif. He's fulfilling his mother's wish and guiding the world on its best course. He's insightful, he makes sure to reassure Selif when he's feeling down, and he can even get aggressive when Selif needs to be pushed to make a hard choice. He's a fantastic advisor. So it seems that Lewin has truly matured, and grown into a great man who's helping the world as best he can, even if he's no longer on the front lines. Except for one tiny issue. If Lewin is married to Fury, his son Sed will come to talk to him once he's recruited, and Lewin is... well... a complete jackass. He learns of Fury's death and the suffering of their children, Sed and his younger sister Fee, and he doesn't even shed a single tear over it. Hell, he doesn't even sound upset. He just blows off Sed and tells him he abandoned his family for a reason, and doesn't bother explaining beyond that. That reaction is really weird, because from what the player has seen, Lewin is a good man with good values. Abandoning his family to fuck off would be something the Lewin of Chapter 2 would do, not the Lewin now, it makes no sense with what the player has seen. His talk with Fee is no better. He tries to apologize for being a shitty, neglectful dad, and Fee is, understandably, not so easily acceptant of it, since he's pretended she didn't exist when she joined in Chapter 6 to when he talks to her in Chapter 10. So, if he ignored her, she was going to ignore him until he decided to approach her, and eventually he mustered up enough of a fuck to do so. And rather than being kind and trying to do, I don't know, anything other than what he does, he calls her a brat for giving him the silent treatment. This really, really makes Lewin unlikable, and it's easily to just completely hate him at this point. Hell, I couldn't blame a player if these scenes soured Lewin for them. But if Lewin was paired off to Sylvia or Teltu, his scenes with his daughters are actually really nice. With he and Sylvia's daughter, Lean, he shows concern over her safety and hears her vent about her parents, as she's never met them and thinks Lewin might know some stuff. He tells her that her parents always loved her, and that even now they watch over her with love and kindness, though he doesn't disclose that he's her father. And with he and Teltu's daughter, Tinny, he hears of how terrible Tinny and her mother suffered at the hands of Hilda, and hearing what happened to his wife and daughter, it makes him start to cry in sorrow. But again, he doesn't reveal that he's Tenny's father. She says that she was told her father was dead, and he makes no attempt to explain otherwise. Now this disparity makes no sense whatsoever, but bear with me, it's gonna make sense in a bit. In the final chapter, Lewin really just does nothing but give a huge ass lore dump about, well, everything. Which I wouldn't be bringing up, but it's weird how he seems to know all that stuff. And the ending is a weird note, because Lewin again abandons all responsibility to lead Solis, leaving it to whoever his son ends up being. 
and Lewin himself remarked that he has to leave again, and Selif bids him farewell. But he doesn't say goodbye to Lewin. He says that the world will never forget the kindness of the dragon that broke tradition and helped guide mankind. He bids farewell to Forseti, the hero of the wind, and then the game just ends. So, what the fuck does that mean? Well, to explain that, all you have to do is beat the game. Twelve times. See, every time you beat the game, the opening demo, the scenes that play before the title screen, get more scenes. Now, most of these are just fun little bonuses for the player that like replaying the game. It's just stuff like Patty swiping some gold, or Ira and Arden training together, and some recreations of big story moments like Quan or Sigurd's death. But one event that shows only if you beat the game 12 times is very strange, because unlike the others, it depicts an event that the player never saw, nor were they ever told happened. It shows Lewin fighting Manfroy and getting killed by him which was never possible in-game, as Manfroy never appeared as an enemy in the first generation. But after that, it shows a character named Forseti reviving Lewin with the Valkyrie Staff after this supposed death, and from there... Well, who fucking knows what that meant? So, if we take this at face value, that means that Lewin WAS killed in the Battle of Valhalla, or shortly after it, and was revived by the dragon Forseti. But Lewin never mentions this, leaving some to believe that he was possessed by the aforementioned dragon, and that Lewin is still dead, it's just his body is being used as a vessel. This explains why Lewin seems to be omnipotent about Udral, as he's a centuries-old dragon who's lived through everything. It also explains why he's so detached from Fury, Sed, and Fee. Those people are, quite literally, not Forseti's fucking problem. But then, why does Lewin seem to care about Lean? Why does he cry over Tail Chu's death? Why does he feel guilt over what happened in the first generation? Is Lewin perhaps still in there a bit? Maybe Lewin was revived, and he manages to peek through the cracks of Forseti's possession? Well, to quote the writer, lead director of the game, and our grand god, Shozo Kaga, this is actually one of my favorite themes, and I won't give a definite answer. You can put the pieces you learn together in different ways, depending on how you play the game. It might be that, in Selef's chapter, the Dragonkind borrowed Lewin's consciousness for a moment. Or, if Lewin was killed in Sigurd's chapter, the Lewin that appears in Selef's chapter could be an actual dragon acting as his substitute. So, straight from the author's mouth, the answer to all possible theories is yes. There is no one true Lewin theory. It is purposefully left to audience interpretation. Personally, I think Lewin is dead and Forseti took over, but Lewin is still in there a bit, and that causes him to break out sometimes. But really, I can't give an answer to the Forseti question. All I can say is that Lewin is a fantastic character. He has incredible character development, some great character scenes, and he enriches the story of the game with his interesting second-gen characterization. Lewin is fondly remembered by FE4 fans for a good reason. The Child of the Wind is a character sure to blow you away. Hey guys, what's this you got over here? A wallet? But, it's empty. We need to fill it with other people's money. And I happen to know a great incentive for other people to give me their money. That's right, I have a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to things like shoutouts on videos, and early access to panels on videos that I'm working on. And if you want to shell out the big bucks, you can get access to polls that decide future videos on the channel. Right now, it's a battle of the villains. And Ashnard is dead in the water, but Medeus might be able to catch up to Leon. We'll see. My patrons include the likes of Andrew Crockett, Atomic X160, Ben's Again, Dr. McBackstab, Elizabeth Von Essar, Fire Emblem Lord, Follow Penta the North Star on Twitch, Galade Knight, 
Great Riek, Green Brigand, Hell on Heelys, Just Besito 2, Keithan, Lightning Bolt, Memmy, Neverix the Fallen Shield Guy, Ranger Man Sam, Ryan Walter, Shen Lu, Space1255, Steph D, Tato, Ya Girl Olwyn, Anti Ginger, Brentendo 11, Drew Hack, Kazu Foxfire, Mathematicus, and Max. Thank you all for your continued support, and I'll see you in the next one. And that's all she wrote. We've made it to the end of yet another character analysis video. Thank you very much for sticking by all these episodes. As always, I'd like to thank the Green Brigand, good old guy of mine, always helps watch over the script and make sure I'm not absolutely crazy. If you enjoyed the video, please consider joining my Discord. You're seeing some stuff from it right now, we have a good time there. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, join the Patreon, and... Celebrate Piccolo Day! I mean, I guess this last part doesn't really work if you're watching this on any day other than the day it's released, but, uh... Don't forget, May 9th, Piccolo Day. Until next time... Yeah.